All right then, all right then. Ladies and gentlemen, if you never see another show, you will never see this one. My name is Mark Lewis. I am a professional storyteller. What makes me a professional? People pay me to do what I do. And there's nothing better in the world than getting paid for what you love to do the best. And people say to me, Mark, where do you get your inspiration? They say, where do your stories come from? I tell them that I have a muse, one of the goddesses. I'll be walking around being Mark. La, 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 la. My muse will come down and go, Psst. Huh? She says, have I got a story for you? Now, why she talks like that, I can't tell you, but that's the way she talks. And I say, well, look, I'm really busy right now. And she says, mm, don't tell me you're busy. Sorry. She sets me down. Then she takes out a perfectly stretched white canvas. Where'd I put it? There it is. And she puts it up in front of me. Oh, I'll turn it to you. And then she gets out a very sharp pencil and she says, watch. And she starts to sketch out the story. Now some parts, she puts it in perfect detail. She says, this is exactly what that character's face, let me get the mouth right. There. That's what that character's face looks like. Other parts, she just blocks in the big shapes. When she's done, she says, okay, it's your turn. And I say, yeah. And I get out my paint box. <coughs> and my palette, and I squeeze out some uh, blue nouns, and some uh, yellow adjectives, and some, where did I put, there it is, red verbs. I love red verbs. Then it's my job as the storyteller to mix the colors that make the pictures, that makes the words that tells the story, that lives in the house that Jack built. I call what I do word pictures. Now what this means is, I do not want you to think about what I'm talking about. Which is perfect for this time of day, right? Yeah. No thinking allowed. I just want you to see what I'm talking about. So, if I was to say to you the word tree, I do not want you to give me the, the Oxford Dictionary definition. I do not want you to go, tree, now. Deciduous plant, I mean, what's it? I get it. That's not what I want. When I say tree, I want you to see. The tree. This is all about storytelling, word pictures, and the imagination. So to start out with, I have a story here that has everything you need for a classic storytelling. In this story, there is a brave hero. How do you do? Who sets off to do battle with a ferocious beastie. Whoa. But the best thing about this story is that almost all the words in the story are nonsense words. Nonsense. Yeah, if I was to read it to you, where did I put it? There it is. Here's how it would sound. <clears throat> Twas brillig and the slithy toes did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borogoves and the momrats outgrave. It goes on. Beware the. Do you know this word? Jabber, jabber, walk. We've well, heard this. You've read this. Jabber walk, my son. The jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jub jub bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. What's a momrath? Say, I don't know. Come on, audience, put me the hell. I call this the math class exercise. I don't know. What is a borogove? What's a slithy tove? Actually, it's a tove that's just a little more slithy than the one you had lunch with yesterday, sir. It's very simple. It's nonsense. <clears throat> but my job as the storyteller is to take all the nonsense in the story <laughs> and make it make sense. So I'm going to do for you 
my version of Lewis Carroll's greatest hit. This is from Through the Looking Glass. Oh, you're going to love it. It has, it has the brave hero. It has the father going, beware the devil. It has the monster. So, this is Lewis Carroll's Jabber Walking. Lie the toes, did gyre and gimble in the grave. O oh, mimsy were the brogues and the moan wraths out grey. Beware the jabber walk, my son. <laughs> the jaws that bite. <laughs> The claws that catch. Whoa! <laughs> Beware the jump, jump bird and shun the frrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
She's different, even at 25, it's still hard for her. And when she was in fourth grade, she had a really hard time because in fourth grade, all of the kids were clicking. Were they forming into cliques or clicks? And she was getting clicked out because she's different. That never happens to any of us, right? We're always included in everything, right? Yeah, right. And she would come home from school in tears. And I would sit and I would listen to her. And by the way, I have discovered the secret of being the dad of girls. The secret is your job is not to fix it. Your job is to sit and listen until they finish speaking. And then you say, hmm, that must be really hard. And so I sat and I listened and my heart broke because I remember what a terrible time I had when I was in fourth grade because I was that same kid. I am still that same kid. That is why I stand up here and talk for a living. <laughs> so, I wrote this next story for me and for her and for all of us who are a little bit different because guess what? It's really important to be different. The story is called The Vegetable Lady. It goes like this. The Vegetable Lady lives down our street. Her flowers and gardens are always so neat. And the love of her plants, <laughs> it's never discreet. That's why she's the Vegetable Lady. She's tall, she's pretty, with hair like a storm. Her garden and clothes are all comfy and warm. And the dirt on her knees, <laughs> it's always the norm for the hardworking vegetable lady. We see her each morning on our way to school. She's singing and she's weeding with her digging tool. To be in the garden seems always the rule. She's the wonderful vegetable lady. Now, the proof of her skill, it's in these baskets she brings. <clears throat> filled with squash fit for emperors and cabbage for kings with carrots and turnips and peppers on strings. What a treat from the vegetable lady. Well, one day, it was cloudy. I was cranky and cold. My sweater was droopy. My socks were too old. Home from school, past her garden, on my bike I rode. And I looked at the vegetable lady. Her eyes were all shiny, her cheeks like a rose, her hat on her head and her glasses on nose. And I looked, and she looked. Okay, I was pale, I suppose. What's wrong? asked the vegetable lady. Well, I got off my bike, I walked in through her gate. I plopped down beside her, now feeling too great. Like a ball losing air, I began to deflate. As I said to the vegetable lady, well first, I fell down, and all the kids laughed at me. Then, I messed up a test. Then, a pop fly just got past me. I mean, this whole ding dong day has been one big catastrophe. I give up. This is miserable. Well, she sat down beside me, right there in the beans. Dried off my cheeks, wiped my tears in her jeans. She hugged me and whispered, hey, my friend, my friend. Life's tough, so it seems. Walk with me, said the vegetable lady. She showed me her cucumbers. She showed me her peas, her zucchini. No, her zucchini, no. Her zucchini, Swiss chard watercress and fruit trees, 
Well, there's something in common amongst all of these. Can you tell? Ask the vegetable lady. Each of these things grows with sunlight and toil, and they help them to grow and to sprout and uncoil. A bit of manure is mixed into the soil. Phew, stinky stuff, quote the vegetable lady. So, when in your life you feel clouds in your face, and you're down in the dumps feeling blue like this case, and it feels like manure's all over the place, think of this, said the vegetable lady. The thing to remember when you're feeling low is bad stuff, it's going to happen, but it helps you to grow. So learn from it, thank it, and soon you will know you'll be better, said the vegetable lady. Well, just then, the clouds parted, and down through the trees came a warm ray of sun. On a rose-scented breeze, I jumped up. I hugged her. She was still on her knees. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mrs. Vegetable Lady. Well, the vegetable lady lives down our street. Her flowers and gardens are always so neat, and we, we wink at each other each time that we meet. <laughs> She's my friend. She's the vegetable lady. It's something to remember when the manure gets deep in your world. Just keep growing through it. Growing through it. I, all of my life, have loved mythology. Love the stories. Archetypal, ah, story, story, story. One of my favorite stories is the myth of Icarus and Daedalus. The ones about the wings to fly. Amazing story. But there's a story behind the story that you know. So the story takes place on the island of Crete in the Mediterranean. And that's where the kingdom of King Minos is, okay? King Minos has a problem. He has a monster on his hands. Anybody know the name of the monster? Minotaur. The Minotaur, correct. Man's body, bull's head. Eats human flesh, which is hard. Because you can't just drop down to the store and pick up a box of Minotaur chow. So what happens is that every seven years, the Athenians have to send seven young men and seven young women to be fed to the Minotaur, which kind of cuts down on the young men and women in Athens. Right? Well, the Minotaur is kept in a, in a maze called the Labyrinth. It's a maze that's so confusing that once you're in it, you can't figure out how to get out. The, Minotaur, the Labyrinth was built by a man named Daedalus, the smartest man in the world. Okay, so as this story gets ready to start, Theseus, the son of the king of Athens, is chosen as one of the young men to be fed to the Minotaur. And when the young men and women arrive in Crete, they all get marched in front of King Minos, who's looking at them, and they're all weeping, and Theseus is standing there. Now, now Theseus is the hero. Everybody say hero. Hero. Right? He comes walking up, and Minos is looking at him. Now, Minos' daughter, Ariadne, is standing beside him. She sees Theseus, and she goes, Oh, baby. Because he is the hero. She doesn't want him to die. So she goes to Daedalus and she says, you gotta help me. Because I don't want Theseus to be killed. How does he get out of the labyrinth? And Daedalus says, I can't help you. I don't know. Even I can't figure it out, but I have an idea. He gives her a sword and he gives her a ball of twine, which is also called a clue, a C-L-E-W, a clue, right? Gives them to her. She gives him to Theseus. He hides him under his robe, all right? So the drums are beating. <laughs> Torches are burning. The door to the labyrinth opens. The Athenians get put inside and the door closes. Theseus is the... He's smart. He takes the ball of twine and he ties it to the doorway. And as he goes through the labyrinth, he lets the twine out. All right? He finds the minotaur and kills it. And then how does he get out again? He follows the clue through the labyrinth and he escapes. Now, King Minos is not happy about this. He knows he had to have had help. So what he does, he takes Daedalus and his son Icarus, and he imprisons them in a tower in his castle. Now, this is where my story starts. Now, this story, I wrote this one. This one has a $10,000 rhyme in it. I rhymed labyrinth. So come with me away from here, away from Victorian London back through time. 
down across the Mediterranean. We see the flying fish and the dolphins. And we hear the surf breaking up in front of us. And as we see, we see the rocks of the island of Crete and the waves breaking across them. We come up over the waves and across the plain. And there we see the empty labyrinth and the castle of Minos and the tower. This is the ballad of Icarus. Imprisoned in the castle of King Minos, surrounded by a field of hyacinth, were Daedalus and Icarus, the man and the son of the man who built the labyrinth. The Minotaur is dead, and Theseus has fled. King Minos raids, bring Daedalus to me. I've been betrayed by friend and kin. Someone must pay for this Athenian's victory. Imprisoned for immemorial time, beneath and in the sky. Oh, we can't escape, said Icarus. The walls are much too high. Only the birds are truly free. A gleam came to his eye. Tis madness for us to dream of flight. Tis folly not to try. So up in the tower, beeswax and feathers, leather thongs and strings, hour slipped through hour as they toiled within the tower until they had constructed two pairs of fragile wings. Daedalus says, before we leave this prison tower, to tread upon the God's own sky, a word of warning would I give. Fly not too low, fly not too high. The moment we trade earth for air, you'll feel the wind fulfill your wings. Beware the ocean's misty grasp. The waves reach up and moisture clings, and leaden feathered you will fall, my son. Take heed and shun these things. Yet. Far above the ocean's threat, a danger worse. Beware the sun. Our wings so fragile will not hold. The heat will cause the wax to run, my son. Daedalus says, don't go near the sun, don't go near the sun. Don't go near the sun, you're bound to fall. Don't go near the sun, don't go near the sun. Don't go near the sun, you lose it all. The wonders of the skies had filled him. He did not heed his father's words, and as his heart soared, so did he. Daedalus watched him join the birds. He was free. His father joined him in the air. At last, they had mastered the mysteries of flight. Daedalus soared with the grace of a seabird, while Icarus flew like a moth toward the light. He rose past the clouds. He ascended the heavens, his heart beating faster. He sang through the air, past the gates of euphoria. Icarus, he flew above. Icarus, and higher still. Icarus, he flew until. Icarus, father! <sighs> he watched him fall. Like a butterfly wingless. Like a puppet left stringless. <clears throat> he watched him fall. <clears throat> Daedalus flew to the place on the ocean, shed tears on his only son's grave, marked only by feathers blowing over the waters and islands of beeswax afloat on the waves. I have a trick to show you. Everyone has to have a trick. The next thing I'm going to do for you is a song I wrote to be played by two recorders. This is a recorder duet. But since I have no one here to duet with, I am going to duet all by myself. Thank you. I am going to play both of the recorders simultaneously, at the same time, together, in unison. That's the Department of Redundancy Department. Thank you, thank you. I have a soprano and a tenor. The recorder duet. It's a song for two recorders and one mouth. My mouth. 
You don't think I can do it, do you? I can. Do you? I can. I can. Let's see. <clears throat> this is also called Imitate Baroque. You can. Don't fix it. Thank you. Thank you. Ready? in my work that every human being is a storyteller because every human being has a story to tell. And I've discovered when people tell their stories and be heard, it changes your life because you're now part, you're one of us. You're a human, right? And a friend of mine says, if you have a belly button, then we're related. And years ago, I was sitting by the lake, a lake in the Canadian Rockies. This is over in, that, in, the, in the New World. And I was sitting there and, and my muse came down. I have a muse that gives me my stories. I told you about that at the beginning. My muse's name is Enthusiasmus. She's the tenth muse. Enthusiasmus is Greek. It means the spirit within you. So when you're enthusiastic, it means your spirit is shining through. And I was sitting by the lake and my muse came down, tapped me on the shoulder and gave me this whole story Word for word, literally, I had to write it down while I was listening, except for the last line, which took me a year to write, because sometimes you have to trust in creativity. The story explains where the magic comes from, it explains how this works to me, and it's what I want to share with you here at the end of my show. This is called the story of word pictures. It goes like this. Sit down beside me. I'll tell you a story of beautiful women and men who are bold. The kind of a story to help us remember the wonder of childhood before we grew old. A story of word pictures, of sulfur and tin, of fern banks and forests that you can hide in. Of little brown people as tall as your knees who walk very quickly through doorways in trees, <clears throat> spires of moonlight, shells on the beach, the soft, silent sermons, the butterflies preach. A small elfin maiden in spiderweb gowns goes gliding right past you one foot off the ground. <laughs> the old learned wizard whose mist-shrouded tower watches his watches chime hour on hour and wait for the wind to come running up fast and watch as his footprints go past in the grass. So, think of a feeling from when you were younger. Yeah? Now give it a color or call it by name. Then pull up the covers and keep your head under and smile at the darkness and know who's to blame. So, if you can gather these pictures I scatter like, like daisies in sunlight, you weave in the chains. Then we'll be the ones who will look for the rainbows, while others think only of clouds when it rains. I'm Mark Lewis. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Happy Christmas. Merry Christmas. Enjoy. 
enjoy the rest of your stay here in London.